Good morning. Hello. Um, so we were talking about uh, Tonk and so on, um, and uh, on Wednesday, Friday. On Friday, we'll go on to look at Davidson's uh, uh, discussion of truth and meaning in reality without reference. But uh, today, I want to carry on thinking about Tonk a little bit. Um, I mean, Tonk is uh, it's very powerful. Once you have that sign in the language, you can prove practically anything, right? If you have, that, that, that was what we saw last time. Once you let the word in, you can now prove just anything you would like. And it's not that you have to believe these things in advance. Just by having the sign in the language, you can now prove lots of things that you couldn't have otherwise. Um, and uh, in the case of Tonk itself, I, I don't think we'd really go for it. If someone did, it you, you wouldn't be persuasive. But it's arguable that when we think about offensive language, when you think about the idea of words that are in themselves objectionable, um, then what that has to do with is something about the power that a bit of language can have just in itself. The idea is that if you have that sign in the language, then you're going to be able to prove lots of things that you couldn't have otherwise. Um, and that's why it can be important to get that bit of language out of use. Um, so I want to start out by talking about that just a little bit and then go back to looking at Tonk. Um, so the idea is not that just that sometimes people insult each other um, I, I, you know, I, uh, uh, someone might say to you, you've got very big ears. And, um, you know, you might think, well, <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I'm perfectly proportioned, you might think. Um, but, so you might resist the insult, but um, uh, that's not, the, you, you wouldn't thereby um, uh, say that the notion of big or the notion of an ear should be thrown out of the language. You might not, you wouldn't say that bit of language in itself is objectionable. Um, whereas people very, I mean, there are plenty of words here that if I scattered them around, it would set off a firebomb in the class, right? You would say, you can't say that, right? Even if you say them in quotation marks, even if you use them very carefully. Um, so I, I don't want to actually get into giving examples and so on. I, <laughs> I know it would take us into some kind of sewer. Um, so suppose you take a fairly, uh, a reasonably, well, we'll see, <laughs> a reasonably clean example. Suppose you take a phrase like latte drinker um, used pejoratively. Um, and um, uh, so, I mean, this is kind of a light example, but just keep in mind, for each of you, there are going to be words that would really fire you up. And you just don't, don't do this out loud, but just as a mental exercise, think how it would work for your um, favorite example. Uh, so suppose you, set, you explain the meaning of latte drinker like this. The introduction rule for latte drinker is, if someone drinks lattes, if someone's often seen carrying a latte, then um, you're allowed to infer they're a latte drinker. And then given that someone's a latte drinker, you can infer from that that they're an elitist intellectual out of touch with the concerns of ordinary people. Um, so look at that. If you've got that sign in the language, you can now prove lots of things that you couldn't have otherwise. Right? I mean, um, just talking to me, you would never guess that I was any kind of elitist intellectual. Right? You would think I was just a regular guy. You would think, of course he's in touch with common people. Listen to him. <laughs> um, but then you see me carrying the latte. And now, because you've got this sign in the language, you can now prove something that you couldn't have otherwise. Because you can prove that he's a latte drinker, because look, he drinks lattes. And then given the elimination rule, you can prove is an elitist intellectual out of touch with ordinary people. Now, that's kind of, uh, I, I mean, if, 
the thing is, think about what happens if you're born in a culture or some term like that, or some variant of it, is just used the whole time. That has a lot of power. That will let you prove things that you couldn't have otherwise. And it will be very hard for you to um, know when to dig your heels in when someone is making an argument. If someone says about me, look, he's an elitist intellectual out of touch with ordinary people. And you say, no, he's not. And they say, but look, he's a latte drinker. And you say, well, yes, that's right. Because look, I mean, the introduction rule is met. And then you, but you're familiar to, I mean, you never learned this explicitly, it was just part of growing up. But you learned this as a part of your general education, that that's the elimination rule. Given that someone's a drinker, you can infer that. Um, then just because you've got that bit of language in your vocabulary, you're going to make those inferences, you're going to be able to prove those kinds of things. Um, and if you ask, well, what intuitively is the problem here? You might say, well, I mean, the trouble is, with these kinds of examples, the, your tendency is to think, well, what's wrong with them is something about the attitudes they embody or something like that. But it's, very, it's hard to know quite what that means. Um, uh, intuitively, it's something like, is, is this right? When you look at what the input is and when you look at what the out, oh, sorry. Uh, when you look at what the input is and when you look at what the output is, how come, given that's the input, that's the output? There doesn't seem to be any balance here between the input and the output. If that's all it took to prove X is a latte drinker, how come you can get so much out of it? Th th that's a natural way to put the, the, the problem with the notion. No balance between the input and the output. But another way to think of it is, you don't know what it takes for it to be true that someone's a latte drinker. If you're using the term um, governed by these rules, then what, it, what does it take to be true? Well, on the one hand, you might say, well, what it takes to be true that X is a latte drinker is just that they drink latte. But then if that's all it takes to be true, how come you can infer that thing about elitist intellectuals? And on the other hand, if you say, well, in order to be a latte drinker, they've got to be an elitist intellectual, then how come you can establish it just by saying that uh, they drink lattes? Um, I mean, to take another kind of example, um, suppose you took, I mean, <laughs> I just made this up. I, I strongly hope there's no such thing as a yad. There are no yads here. <laughs> I mean, suppose you take some kind of nationalistic slur, like um, if you're from a geographical area G, then you can infer X is a yad, and from X is a yad, you can infer X is unpunctual. And so I say, you know, we're waiting for someone, and I say, well, he's a yad. Um, <laughs> what do you expect? Um, <laughs> um, if you got that, that, I mean, that again has the same kind of pattern to it, that on the one hand, you might think there's, some kind, there's something wrong with a balance here between the input and output rules. And, but also, what are you saying when you say X is a yard? And you don't know what it is for X is a yard to be true. Now, so far, this is just putting it in terms of negative cases where you're deriving something um, uh, disagreeable about people from these kind of terms. There probably are cases where you get something like this effect, but it's beneficial. I mean, suppose somebody has um, a term like one of God's children. Now, I don't mean that in a theological... You, you can use a phrase like one of God's children without it actually expressing um, some, some kind of theological belief. What I mean is, if you say about someone, well, they're one of God's children, you could be using that in a way where the introduction rule is something like, they're a human being. That's all it takes to be one of God's children. You've just got to be a human being. And on the other hand, the output is that person ought to be treated with courtesy and respect and affection and so on. You see what I mean? So there could be cases where you've got terms like that where there's no balance, really. I mean, <laughs> frankly, in my view, it just isn't true that just because you're a human being, you ought to be treated with courtesy and respect and affection and so on. Um, there are famous counterexamples, right? Um, um, 
But anyway, <laughs> setting that personal view aside, uh, there, there, it does seem to be a kind of lack of balance there between the inputs and outputs. But the lack of balance there could actually be a good thing for the way it makes someone behave. If someone's brought up with a term like that in their vocabulary, that could actually make them behave better than they would have otherwise. And again, the point here is just the power that the bit of language has. Um, so I think what's interesting here is not just exactly that the terms have undesirable consequences. I mean, they very often do, and that's again a hot button cases where you say, I don't even want that in the language. You can't use that word even in inverted commas, even if you're just reporting what someone else said. Um, uh, the thing is, even you can have cases that are with the same general structure where the consequences aren't particularly undesirable. The problem is just the most basic thing that you can't say what those terms refer to. OK, so that's a very light schematic uh, overview of what, what I think. I mean, this kind of analysis is not mine. This was um, uh, put forward by Michael Dummett. Um, about 20 years ago, but it seems like quite a powerful analysis of why some terms are offensive, and tonk is just a sterile example of an offensive term like that. Is that reasonably clear what, what I'm saying here? I mean, I've, I put it very schematically and so on, but I, <laughs> uh, I actually think this is quite important for your attitude to bits. I mean, I mean practical life and everyday life. This is actually quite important. For your attitude to uh, terms you're using, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting so caught up with the example. I'm forgetting. What is the bigger picture? What well, to make? Oh, what is the bigger picture? Okay, yeah. the the very bigger picture that, that I will get onto in a moment is um, Wittgenstein was talking about there only being the use and forget about talk about truth or reference right. when you're characterizing meaning. Yeah. So um, then Pryor said, consider Tonk where you can describe the use, but it's very hard to say in terms of truth or reference what tonk means. Yeah? Um, and uh, I'm generalizing that a bit and saying, if you took a Wittgensteinian view of uh, uh, that only being the use, then your use of terms like latte drinker or yad or whatever your favorite hot button term is, then um, uh, there wouldn't be any way of criticizing that. That's just what the word means. Yeah. So really the big picture here is, how is it possible to criticize the use of a word? Yeah. In a Wittgenstein's picture, there is no way of criticizing it, it seems to me. Yeah. You just say, it's the way of my people. We all talk about latte drinkers and yads and so on. That's, that's just the way of our people. Yeah. I'm going to say quite a lot about that in a moment. but. Um, uh, just to anticipate what, what I, uh, not, not to, uh, so would you take this one, X is from geographical area, G, and X is unpunctual, right? Um, how, how oh, what does it take to be a yad? Is it enough? Is being a yad just a matter of coming from geographical area G? Class? Is being a yad, what does the term is a yad refer to? What does a predicate is a yad, is, what is it talking about? Is there such a thing as being a yad? Is being a yad just the same thing as coming from geographical area G? Yes. Yes? I, well, I see why you say that, because if you look at the introduction rule, it must be. Yeah, because the introduction rule tells you that's all it takes to be a yad, right? But if you look at the elimination rule, that isn't all it takes to be a yad. You've got to be unpunctual, right? So if there are punctual people who come from geographical area G, which I bet you there are, right? Then um, there's no such thing as being a yad. You don't know what it takes to be a yad. Do you have to be unpunctual and do you, uh, 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 as, as well as coming from geographical area G? Uh, one, two. Um, you could, well, well you, you, the, the thing is that you're not entitled to suppose that. And actually, if you think in real cases, 
Yeah, of, of negative terms being used about people of some nationality, say. I mean, the whole point about these things is they're not in general true. You, you see what I mean? So suppose it's not true. So, I mean, the thing is, in a sense you're right, you're, you're supposing that everyone from geographical area G is uh, unpunctual. Yeah? If that was true, this would work. Yeah? Um, but, um, and then you could say, well, all that, mat all that, uh, all that matters for it is um, being an unpunctual person from area, from, be, be, coming from geographical area G is enough. Yeah? But in general, in these cases, that's not true. Yeah. And if it's not true, then there's no such thing as being a yard. Because you can't say what it takes. Yeah? One, two. That's right, uh, but the rest is an actual implication. I mean, that's the thing about these negative terms, that you just take it for granted. But Given the use of the term, then all these negative consequences follow. But then could it be said that the actual implication is not X is unpunctual, but X is probably unpunctual? That could be, well, that could be true too, yeah. Right, but all, all, all you have to say here is take someone who would never in a million years, take someone from geographical area G, who would never in a million years be unpunctual. Yeah? Um, Hell's foundations would have to quiver before they were unpunctual. Right? They're not probably unpunctual. Yeah? Are they still a Well, that's the thing. <laughs> uh, there is really no way of answering that question. On the one hand, they must be because of the introduction rule, and on the other hand, they can't be because the, you don't get the elimination rule. Yeah. Uh, one, two, three. Okay. Things are hotting up. Yeah. Uh, so, if there is no such thing as a yeah, then how do we make this inference? I mean, it, it seems like when we make this inference, we're not really right. entitled to make it. That's right. The, 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 so, we've got to be able to spell out um, uh, why we're not entitled here. And what I'm suggesting is the reason we're not entitled is there's no way of saying what the term refers to. So to go back to the big picture here, on Wittgenstein's view, it seems like this kind of characterization would be all there is to say about the meaning of a term. And we're going to forget that stuff about reference. Remember I kept saying, so if Wittgenstein's right, then what we were doing in the first nine weeks of the term was just a mistake. Yeah, because the notion of reference is not central to language use. And what I'm suggesting is that here you can see a way in which it is central, that you want to be able to talk about reference in order to explain what's going wrong in this kind of case. Yeah? Because the rule is perfectly coherent. Yeah? It's actually, it's not even like Tonk, where you do get a contradiction. Yeah? You don't get a contradiction here, not in any obvious way. Um, yeah. Uh, one, two. Right. So what, you know, I, I think that first inference, we need to tell us more about what Yad is. Is it like, is it the unpunctual person? Uh, well, it, that's, that's the thing. This is all you get. So your task is to say what's wrong here. I suppose you grow up, right? Suppose you're in a village right next to, right next, suppose Yad is a village, right? And you grow up in the village right next door. Yeah. Then, um, so you grow up saying of people, they're a yad, uh, just on the basis of them coming from the village next door. But you are willing to draw this conclusion. It's just part of what a yad is that you draw this conclusion. Yeah. Um, that's what I mean, that um, uh, given that, let's suppose, that there are plenty of, unpunctual, plenty of punctual yads, potentially, Plenty of punctual people from that village. <laughs> <Print. laughs> Plenty of punctual people from that village. Yeah, then um, you have no way of saying what, what, which you're talking about. Does that make sense? Does okay. So the, the the basic thing here, and I think I think this is true of pejorative terms in general, that. 
The whole point is, you don't have to establish independently that they're unpunctual. Given that they're from that area, the term alone takes over and drives you to these further expectations as to what they're like. Uh, usually works by your saying where they're from. Uh huh. But that, isn't that all right? That is saying where they're from. In a way, that's trying to say where they're from. Come back to this. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Or Jane, what if we said it was um, due to some, uh, you know, like your gender or. Yes, right, 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 sure. And then um, you have some sort of term to refer to all members who possess that kind of um, reproductive organ, right? That's right. That, uh, I mean, I mean <laughs> I'm with you and not wanting to push all the hot buttons here, but that is exactly, that, that we're getting closer to, <laughs> to real world examples here, yeah. Well, like, Yes. Yeah. So I could say like that person is a blank. Yeah. And it comes with it all these implications and connotations, but they're not, I think, explicitly spelled out, and the harder to spell them out concisely is that. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, um, I think in real cases it would be harder to spell them out. The, the whole point, though, is that they are there. There is this cloud of negative things there. Even though, as you say, it might be difficult to spell them out concisely. And I guess, like, in that situation, like, it would seem almost like they're self-referential or kind of, like, identity statements. Uh -huh. Just because with that word that's associated with a person's gender already comes with these implications. And then that's right. Right. So I guess, like... I... I think what you're saying is completely right, that usually there's a kind of, it's not usually impossible, I think, to spell out something as to what the core implications are, um, but um, are you right that there would usually be a kind of cloud of associations here, rather than some one simple definite thing like this? I think that's right. But the whole point about these terms is that there is that cloud of negative implications. Yeah. Like that, you were use yeah. That word. Yeah. That, well, that's the thing. You could take the output as basic and use that to define what it takes to be a yad, right? What it takes to be a yad is that you be unpunctual. Right? Um, but then you wouldn't have the right to say X is a yad merely on the basis of the geographical area they come from, yeah? but, or, or merely on the basis of their sex. Yeah, in your example, that, um, that, um, but the whole point about these terms is that's the way they work. That you are allowed to say X is a yad merely on the basis of the geographical area they come from, and then that's taken to all these implications. Right. Possessing these kind of secondary qualities of just being unpunctual, where I feel like somebody who would make a derogatory sexual comment towards someone right. seems to like aim at scientific evidence or more. Right. The, 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 that's a little bit like the, the person who, uh, when someone says, yeah, but uh, aren't you assuming that all the yads are unpunctual? Yeah, the, 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 that's that kind of case. Um, the whole thing about this term, though, is. It, it absolves you of the need to do the proof. If someone did give a proof that everyone from this geographical area was unpunctual, it would be very hard to complain about this. You, you, you see what I mean? It would be very hard to say that's pejorative. Um, it's just a fact. Yeah? Um, and similarly, if someone did give a scientific proof in some other case that everyone with this characteristic had those further characteristics, um, the, the, that would be, the, uh, it would be very hard to complain about that. You know, you might object and say the proof's not right, but if the proof is re really works, then what is the problem? Yeah? But the whole point about these terms is that they seem to allow you to do without the proof. 
They get you the effect of the proof without having to do the work. You just need the word. The word does all the work for you. That's why people want the words out. You see what I mean? That's why I think it's rational to want the words out. Um, yep. Uh, one, two. Sorry, one. I, I'm just going in the order I saw you. Were. One, two. Yeah. Yeah, please. Well, let's say that in the community some people are willing to use that word, uh-huh. some are not. Yes. That's right. And yeah. so they're sort of committed to that truth, and the other ones aren't. They're committed to that truth. Um, that's a way to put it. I think they're committed to that truth. Yeah, they've got something here that works only if such a thing is true. Yeah. But they needn't ever have spelt out that or um, th- thought about it. They've just got the word. Yeah. And the word is doing all the work for them. It's not that they think they've got some, something here they need to defend. Yeah? The word does all the work for you. Yeah, a, a scientific proof would really do the work. I mean, that, <laughs> that you, you really could have a basis, uh, have a, I mean, Usually in practice, when people give scientific proof, try, give so-called scientific proofs in this kind of area, usually the science is no good. Yeah, but if but I mean people are, are just so loaded about this kind of thing, but um, in the areas we're, we're schematically talking about, yeah. But um, uh, if you could do the science, I mean, um, for example, just the, the example of sex, there are differences between people based on sex. Some live longer. Uh, yeah, the, 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 these these things are just there. Um, there is no denying that some kinds of scientific proof are possible. People from, some, from different geographical areas just do have different genetic characteristics. Uh, you know, these things are just true. Th- that's not in itself the job. The, the, the difficult thing is when the word itself means you can get these conclusions without having to prove anything. Yeah. 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 That's how I mean it to be, yes. Yes. Oh, you if you meet if you meet all the conditions right here. Yes, right. But, but, um, and then suppose X is they just fulfill one of those conditions. They can geographical area G. Right. That's right, that exactly pinpoints it. That, that, that's the case to think about. When someone is from that geographical area, but is uh, not unpunctual, when someone is perfectly punctual, but they are from that geographical area. Yeah. This term proves, uh, merely having this word in your vocabulary lets you prove that they are unpunctual. Yeah. Uh, and then you say, well, something's gone wrong. Or, What's gone wrong here? And I'm suggesting that's, I mean, it's, it's when you think about it, it's difficult to understand why there should be some words that shouldn't be in the language. Why not? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a... I mean, if they're meaningful words... And if you can put it like a dilemma. If they're meaningful words, then why shouldn't they be in the language? And if they're not meaningful, what harm can they do? Yeah, well, what's all the fusses about if they don't have a meaning? But this kind of a, a, analysis lets you pinpoint um, that... If they've got that pattern of use, um, there can still be something wrong with them. And that, that, that's, that's the point that your example make, brings out. Yeah? Um, and uh, going back to the bigger picture, that means that we need more to the account of meaning than Wittgenstein gives. We need something about truth and reference in the account of meaning. I'm sorry, there's another question uh, over here. Uh, I, thought, I thought someone's hand went up. No? Okay. Okay. So um, let's go back and look at Tonk. Um, uh, I think with Tonk, it's natural to think that um, the problem with Tonk is uh, that it lets you derive contradictions. It lets you get all these uh, um, 
uh, wild results like being able to prove anything. And certainly there's a kind of lack of balance between the input rules and the output rules. That's all right, the, the idea that there's a lack of balance here. You get very weak introduction rules and you get a very strong elimination rule. Uh, that's what is going wrong, something like that. But I think there is something more basic here, um, which is you don't really know what someone's saying when they use tonk. I mean, suppose someone says to you, hey, you've won $500, tonk, the sun is shining. Or as you're going out of class, someone says to you, um, that was a great question you raised, tonk, the sun is shining. Should you be pleased? Uh, it's very hard to know because on the one hand, um, in order for someone to have the right to say that, they had to establish both that you've won $500 and that the sun is shining. So you might reasonably say, that's great. On the other hand, you know that you can't infer. Sorry, wait a minute, I've done this around right, right, the wrong way. <laughs> right. Okay, let me... <laughs> um, Someone has the right to, let me go back to the introduction rule. I'm, I'm going ahead to the next example. Um, given the introduction rule for Tonk, um, uh, someone can say you've won $500, Tonk, the sun is shining, if they've either established that you've won $500 or they've established that the sun is shining, right? So they don't need to have established both. So they could have said that without having established that you won $500. Yes? So, sorry? Only if the sun is shining. Only if the sun is shining, right. Um, but, oh, all right, I mean, if the sun is shining, that, of course, is reason to rejoice, but it, you might prefer the $500, uh, right? Um, uh, on the other hand, since they've said, Tonk, you can infer both A and B. So you can infer that, that you've won the $500 from what they say. So you should be pleased. Um, so... When someone says that to you, you won $500, tonk, the sun is shining, suppose that someone completely reliable and authoritative, someone whose words you trust implicitly, well, what should you make of this? I mean, they have the right to say it if one or the other of you won $500 or the sun is shining. So that means you don't have any great reason to be pleased yet. But on the other hand, you can't infer from what they say that you won $500. The, the, the basic model is you have actually no idea what they're talking about. I mean, it's not, it's, this is really not your problem. The thing is, a sign doesn't really mean anything. You don't know what the sign means. So you don't really know what someone's saying when they use tonk. So I want to suggest it's not just that you can prove lots of wild things using tonk or these signs that are out of balance. It's that... Um, there's a subtler thing of just not really having a meaning. So suppose you, th uh, uh, let's take this round the other way. I mean, Tonk is kind of like a um, swaggering, flamboyant gangster of a term that will kind of take charge of all of your language once you let it in. But I mean, in movies where there are swaggering, flamboyant gangsters, there, are, there is often um, the peculiar and very weird sidekick um, who's, um, how should I say, less swaggering, but just as weird in their own peculiar way. Um, so what I mean is, suppose we consider star. Um, the introduction rule for star, star is like a mirror image of Tonk. Um, the here's the introduction rule for star. From If you get A and you get B, you can infer A, star, B. That's all right. So that's like the introduction rule for and. Yes? That's okay. Now here's the elimination rule. If you get A star B, and you can infer C from A, and if you get A star B and you can infer B, C, C from B, so either way you get C, then you can infer C. Right? That's the elimination rule. So that's like the elimination rule for or. Yeah. So the problem with star isn't that you can infer too much from it, right? Because you can hardly infer anything at all from it. But it's so very weird. 
Um, so is that clear? What, is that, I mean, at this stage, the, does that just pop in? Can you see right away what's going on here? Yeah. Um, so you say, um, uh, if I've got the, the introduction rule is from A and from B, you get A star B, and then that's the elimination rule. But the natural question here is, there's something about balance. I mean, if the introduction rule is so strong, if you demand both A and B, and then you can only, well, why can you only then infer C if you can, can get C from either A or B? Why wouldn't it be enough to just get C from A or just get C from B? You see what I mean? Um, the, the introduction rule was so strong, so why is this so weak? Or if you put it another way, if all you're going to do with star is this, is infer C, given you can get C from A and given you can get C from B, then uh, if that's all you're going to do with it, why should you demand both A and B in order to get A star B? Yeah? Um, so now the, the problem there is not at all like Tonk or these offensive terms where the problem is how much you can infer. The problem with star is it's so, <laughs> it's so peculiar and shut off, um, you can't get enough out of it. So if someone says to you, you've won $500, star, the sun is shining, should you be pleased about that? Well, in order for them to have the right to say A star B, they had to have proved that, the sun, that uh, you've won $500 and that the sun is shining. Right, to get this, they had to approve both of those things. But you're not allowed to infer either of them. Because the elimination rule is like the elimination rule for or. For or. Yeah? So should you be pleased? You have no idea. If someone uses star, then you just literally don't know what they're saying. But that's not because you can infer all the wrong consequences. It's because you can't infer enough consequences. You want to get more in the way of consequences than you should do here, than, you, than you're allowed to do here. Yeah? I don't know if that helps. I, hope, <laughs> I, thought, I thought that would help. Uh, so the general point here is just specifying a pattern of use for a term, saying here's the way we're going to use the term and this is our custom, that's not enough to give it a meaning. There is more to meaning than that. Okay, so just to spell this out fully explicitly, remember last time we looked at the trouble when you try and give the truth table for Tonk? Yeah? Uh, you can say, well, if I've got A and B both true, then is A Tonk B true? Well, the elimination, the introduction rule for Tonk tells you that's going to be true because if you get A, you get A Tonk B. If you get B, you get A Tonk B. So you get both A and B, you're going to get A Tonk B. And the elimination rule says if you get A tonk B, you get A, and you get B. So that top line is all right. I hope that, that, stop me if that kind of thing goes too fast. I hope that tonk is familiar at this point to you guys. Yes, it's, okay. Um, but then with the second line, when uh, uh, you say um, one's true and the other's false, and the third line, first one's true, and the, the first one's false and the second one's true, uh, for those second and third lines, what do you say? Um, well, according to the introduction rule, it comes out true both times, because all you need to infer A tonk B is you need one or the other of A or B. So you say, well, that's true both times. But from A tonk B, you're supposed to be able to infer both A and B. So that requires that both A should be true and that B should be true. But that means that in these lines it should be coming out false rather than true when you look at the elimination rule. And what that really means is you can't have them come out true, you can't have it come out false, you just have no idea what to write in there. Yeah? And the same is true of star. Um, so the problem with star is not you can infer too much or you can infer the wrong things, but it has exactly the same kind of problem that if you stay, say, um, what's the truth table for star? Um, then you say, well, uh, if I've got both A and B, 
then uh, by the introduction rule, I get A star B. And by the elim elimination rule, we'll certainly come out um, correct that if I can infer C from A and I can infer C from B, then I get C, if they're both true. But then in the second and third lines, where one's true and the other's false, well, according to uh, the introduction rule, you need both A and B to get A star B. So that should be coming out false both times. But according to the elimination rule, it should be coming out true because so long as you can get C, all the elimination rule demands is that you be able to get C from both A and B to get C. Um, and that only requires that one or the other of A and B should be true. So it should be coming out true. So once again, you have no way of saying if that should be true or false. So you just have to leave a blank there. So there's no truth table for star. So I'm saying this problem with star is the same for, as a problem for tonk. And similarly, if you ask what yad refers to, um, if you just look at the introduction rule, all that yad should refer to is a characteristic of coming from geographical area G. If you look at the elimination rule, it refers to the characteristic of coming from a geographical area G and being unpunctual. Um, but that, there is no characteristic, that, that, that isn't a single characteristic. And there's no such thing as being a yad. So we need truth and reference in. Yes? Okay, so you could win two prizes, okay? Right. So in that case, like, A and B are related in some way. Yes. Some sort of uh. relation between A and B and C. Uh. In your example of $500 and the sunshine, they're not related. Right. But if we say that, for instance, you're a winner, if one of these two are true, or both of them are true. Uh, that's right. Then what kind of truth table would you have for that case? Uh. The truth table is always for a connective, right? It's for and, or if then, or star, or tonk. Right, yeah. That would be a star case, wouldn't it? Uh, Right, exactly, yes. Uh, yeah. But A and B. Well, no. Uh, uh, okay, carry on, carry on. You, could infer, you, could infer, you couldn't infer you won both prizes, which was the example. Yeah, yeah but from um, A star B, you can't infer C even though you are a winner. So That's right. I'm sorry, I don't wish to seem unintelligent, but I don't really understand what's going on. Look, look, look can, can... That's right, so C is equivalent to A or B. Oh, I see, so you're using X as a winner rather than X as won both prizes. Is, it, is that right? Okay. I, I, okay. I, 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 I will. I'll, I'll come. Yeah. L l let's discuss this after class, and I'll raise it at the next time. Um, I, I don't think it's your problem. It's just that it's taking me so long to f figure it out. Okay. 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 So let me whistle through uh, what I think the the larger picture implications are here. Um, 
I think I said Wittgenstein's basic point in, in when he's talking about rule following is really a good one. And the simplest version of it is you can't derive the rules for logical constants from the truth tables. Right? I said that many times, and I think that's completely. <laughs> um, uh, uh, there is just no getting around that. Uh, uh, you, you, to do the der derivation, you already have to use logical rules. Yeah, so you can't regard truth tables as coming first and driving your patterns of transition for logical signs. Um, but you could think of it like this, that when you've got knowledge of truth conditions or reference, then what that's doing is, is giving you knowledge of your objective in using language the way you do. We don't just, in fact, reason like automata back and forth using particular systems of inference. We have some picture of what we're about in using language. And uh, the truth tables um, give us knowledge of what we're doing when we're using the logical constants, what's going on when we're using those signs. And in, so just with the uh, logical signs, we need the truth table to make it intelligible to ourselves what we're doing here. We are not like machines who are simply reacting to what's going on around us. We have a picture of what, we're, what our objectives are in the use of language. So I think it isn't right to say with Wittgenstein, there's only the use. It is right to say knowledge of truth conditions can't be what drives the use. Um, but we have a conception of what, why we're using words in the way we do. So I think maybe we could acknowledge Wittgenstein's point that, nothing, that use is more fundamental than knowledge of truth conditions, isn't derived from knowledge of truth conditions, but keep a role for truth conditions anyhow, and say if we're going to use a bit of language intelligently, there has to be such a thing as your grasp of truth conditions. So the whole project in the first part of the class had to do with explaining the truth conditions of sentences in terms of the references of their parts. So we were focusing on singular reference and um, the way that uh, terms like water and so on refer. So knowledge of truth conditions derived from knowledge of reference could be providing us with knowledge of what we're about in our use of language. And you could say then, to make sense of going right or wrong in particular cases, the reason that we can make sense of the idea of a born cruiser or of um, uh, an individual being right and the rest of the community being wrong is that uh, we have um, a conception of what right or wrong in the use of the signs comes to and is not just a matter of using in accordance with everyone else. Um, we don't have to appeal to the community to, to explain what right or wrong come to. And the thing we've been just talking about with offensive terms or with tonk or with star, there are certain systematic ways of using words that are just wrong because you can't give them a reference. So just to um, go back to where we came in with the Wittgenstein, I was saying you can't regard the bit in the middle here as being what keeps us together. That's what Wittgenstein's right about. You can't regard your knowledge of truth condition in that sense as being what holds the whole use together. The use is more fundamental than that, that if you and I diverged, then that bit in the middle wouldn't be able to do any work in keeping us together. So the thing is, there could be a role for this, even though it wasn't a role in keeping us together. That's to say, even though um, this just b drops out so far as what keeps us together in our use of language goes, being able to specify the reference of your signs may still be important. It may still be important in meaning that there's such a thing as what you're about in using the sign, making it the case that you are using the sign correctly. Whatever the use is, it has to be possible to represent it as capturing how things are with a particular subject matter. Okay, uh, we're on to Davidson next time. Thanks. <laughs>